This video was made possible by a grant from Current TV and was created in partnership with the Outer Banks History Center, which provided the images and video, and we're very grateful to both of them. Um, so our interviewees who appear uh, today, uh, first Carlton P. Uh, Buster Nunemaker. Buster has spent all but five years of his life in Nags Head, where his family ran a fish, groceries, and hardware business and owned the Nags Head Ice and Storage Company. Like his father before him, Buster too has been active in our community, serving on the town's Board of Commissioners and Board of Adjustment. He's also a 22-year veteran of our volunteer fire department, having served as an officer for several of those years. He and his wife Allison live in Nags Head Acres, where he's been a watch captain for 24 years. Buster's father, Carl, um, who also makes an appearance in the documentary, was also heavily involved in the Outer Banks community, playing a big part in Nags Heads Incorporation and serving on our Board of Commissioners as both a commissioner and as a mayor. So welcome, Buster. Thank you. Um, Renee Cahoon. Uh, with a lapse of only five years, of which most of that time was spent on the Dare County uh, Board of Commissioners, that time that she was away from the town, Renee has been a member of Nags Head's Board of Commissioners for 32 years, both as a mayor and as a commissioner. In 2002, then-Governor Michael Easley appointed Renee to the state's Coastal Resources Commission, which works to protect, protect the state's coastal lands and waters. In 2017, Governor Roy Cooper appointed Renee to serve as the chair of the commission. Renee and her family have owned and operated Cahoon's Market, which is right on the corner of the parking lot, and cottages since just before the Ash Wednesday storm hit in 1962. Renee, glad to have you here. Thank you. Juanita Westcott. Um, Juanita grew up in South Nags Head on the beach and retired from the Dare County school system after 30 years. She married Cohen Wayne Westcott, who sadly passed away 10 years ago, and together they had a son and a daughter. She now lives in Mother Vineyard. Welcome. Also with us is Eric Hayden. Eric Hayden is the Warning Coordination Meteorologist with the National Weather Service in Moorhead City, North Carolina, which covers eastern North Carolina, including the Outer Banks. In this position, he is the liaison between the National Weather Service and the community, working closely with emergency managers, television broadcasters, and the public. Eric has been in the National Weather Service for 15 years, working previously at local weather service offices in Binghamton, New York, and Wilmington, North Carolina. Prior to his career with the Weather Service, Eric was a broadcast meteorologist for five years for various cities in upstate New York. Eric received his degree in meteorology from SUNY Oswego in upstate New York. Eric and his wife, Rebecca, live in Cape Carteret and have three children. Eric, glad to have you here. Thank you. Not with us today, but a longtime Nags Head institution is Wayne Gray. Uh, Wayne uh, could not be with us, but he grew up in Avon, left the Outer Banks to join the U.S. Coast Guard. As a second-class bosun mate, Wayne responded to the Ash Wednesday storm from his station at Oregon Inlet. He was later the officer in charge of that station, and after 33 years, Wayne retired from the U.S. Coast Guard as a master petty officer. Continuing his public service, Wayne was a member of Nags Head's Board of Commissioners for eight years. Wayne has a daughter and a son who also retired from the U.S. Coast Guard, and he now lives in Harbinger with his wife, Cheryl. So in his absence, please give Wayne a, a hand, if you would, folks. So I want to ask Eric, there were some images, and you knew something about that storm, about the low and the high and where they were, and that was 1962. So tell me a little bit about weather forensics and how we know about the history of storms like that and, and how you could, were able to speak to that, if you would. Sure. <clears throat> and it was hard to look back at some of the weather history in terms of 
statistics because we didn't have a lot of information in terms of the National Weather Service. The first weather satellite was in 1960. So we were just starting to use that technology and the imagery was uh, very, very slow every 30 minutes to maybe an hour. So now we have it every one to five minutes. Uh, mm -hmm. But we did have surface maps where we could look at the high and low pressures. You would have some uh, reports from ships, but we did not have the vast network of data back then. So we could piece it together, but it was much more challenging than if we had a storm now. Okay. All right. Very good. Thank you for that. I want to ask uh, Buster and Ms. Westcott, um, were there stories um, or is there a story you'd like to share that didn't make the cut, perhaps, that's on the cutting room floor or anything that was in there that you would like to, to sort of amplify for us, Buster? Well, one of the things that, that sticks out the most is, is what would happen today? Mm -hmm. that's, that's the thing that, that I have to say about the video and about some of the things that were said in there. Eric said it very distinctly. Wayne Gray said it very distinctly. And Renee said it very distinctly. I think complacency, everybody knows what complacency, what that word means uh, to each of us, but complacency plays a big part in this. Ignoring authority, creating a burden on emergency services, fire, rescue, police, uh, lives lost. We only had one life that I know of that was lost in the Ash Wednesday storm wow. because our population was not that big. But lives lost because you know and i know and so does the our emergency services people that when you tell people that they need to do something complacency is going to be the first thing that comes to mind for me because i know how many people will not leave uh for a storm so i think we would have loss of life and i think it would be uh devastating to the outer banks uh uh tax wise and and it would be just a massive cleanup. Yep. Ms. Westcott. It wasn't anything that was necessarily left out, but I wanted to speak to the aftermath of the storm. Please. We're in Mandio in an old school building in an auditorium, and we haven't had anything to drink. We haven't had anything to eat, and I have pajamas on. Oh, and uh, you can't come back. We had nothing to come back to. We could have came back and stayed with a sister or something, but... But there was no coming back. The storm was still raging. And you're standing there, and it's evening, and what do you do? And I just appreciate that I had friends. I was in the eighth grade at the time, and I hope Cedric Gergerich is here because Cedric came in. They had school that day. I wasn't there, but there was school that day. The Manio and uh, the kids from Mans Harbor, and, yeah, they were in school, <laughs> seriously. We were being washed away, and they didn't know it. But she came in and she took me home with her, pajamas and all. And they fed me and cared for me like I was their own child. And I so much appreciate that. And within a couple days, as my mom and dad were taken to a Dr. Ornette's house, and some of you know Linda Midget from Manio passed away recently. They took my mom and dad and one of my sisters home with them. And uh, they were just treated so well. And then the Red Cross came in, and I can't say anything bad about the Red Cross because they were there within days, and they set up a station in Manio where we could get clothing. And uh, they rented us a house in Manio. Now, we were a big family. When I say a caravan came out of there, I had brothers and sisters that lived there. They had families. And so we came out in three cars. We ended up with two. And... Um, they rented a huge house in Manio, right where the town hall is now. It was called the Penny Stone House. It was an old house, and you could kind of slide down the sliding board in the rooms upstairs because the floors were falling down. But it was wonderful just to have a place to go. And we stayed there for three months until Daddy got a house rebuilt. Also, we were called a disaster area. And therefore, my dad, who was a most working man I ever knew, he was a man among men. But he took out a small business loan, and I'm telling you, it was 6% interest. Right. Yeah, and that was under a disaster. But in less than seven years, Daddy had everything paid off, and he had bought a small farm in Currituck because he was so weary with the winters over here. Winters are just, they were back then. In the 60s, now we had hurricanes, and we had lots of northeasters that would blow for 
10, 11 days at a time and rained. It was just, it was really a hard life. And every spring you would have to repair things on the pier and things on the houses because they just fall apart. And uh, I think every two years we had to have a new car. But Daddy only lived close to seven years after that storm and passed away. I just think he worked himself to death. We ate lots of chicken backs and lots of fish, I'm telling you, but he had it all paid off. A very hardworking man. I just would like to honor my dad today. Yeah. Very Thank special you. man. Thank you. Well, it's... Renee, is there anything that you would add or amplify? Um, no, not really, Ben. Um, the town's very fortunate. I feel like my family was very fortunate. The pier on this side got destroyed. The property on the other side got destroyed. And water didn't really even come in our cottages. So I don't know what happened except my dad had just bought it like a week before. Wow. And uh, maybe the good Lord was looking after him because he would have lost everything. That, that's Wow. That's amazing. That's another wow. But Buster and Ms. Westcott, I do want to ask you, um, too, among this, I'd like your recollection of going back to the house, what what you saw. I'm sure you went back to the house, the sun was shining. It must have been pretty emotional, too. We didn't go back as children. We didn't go back for a while. My dad, my brother, and my brother-in-law came over and began to clean up. But um, by the time I got back, what amazed me was there was nothing, no debris, no two by fours, no pilings. It was just like it had never happened, except there was no home there. Wow, that's amazing. Well, something that that um, Juanita said about uh, the Red Cross coming in. Uh, I used to love to wear loafers to school. That was the big thing. Even at twelve years old, I loved <laughs> loafers. But loafer, loafers had uh, uh, leather soles, and when your shoes have been in the water for what two weeks <laughs> uh they kind of find their own path and you can't wear them so i went for two weeks without having any shoes at all uh in march and uh to, to top it off my dad would not let me go to the um red cross and get shoes so uh, that was how proud he was now you asked earlier and if i can just indulge in a couple of stories uh, sure i've got some that i tell at rotary club meetings on a regular basis but everybody knows the town of nags head in 1962 bought three fire trucks they should know that they were hail front end pumpers and they were stored at the uh radar station where the old coast guard station was well that was in the epstein track and the water came across and it filled up the garage where these things were located. So my dad and uh, a gentleman by the name of Lewis Mann, who was a town employee, he was basically the only town employee that the, the town had at the time, decided they would go down and try to get those trucks out and save them for the town just in case we had a fire. Well, a gallon of water weighs 8.34 pounds. The big truck had 4,170 pounds of water in it. The other truck had 2,085 gallons of water in it. And guess what they did? Those trucks floated. And we lost all three of those trucks. So uh, I used to see them on the bypass occasionally, and somebody bought them as used parts or used trucks. They turned into a dump truck, and they turned into... You know, who knows what else? All right, so these checkpoints that we had on the bypass and where we had the highway patrol and the National Guard, uh, I hope Linda Jordan's here. Uh, her mother, uh, Charlotte Jordan, was bound and determined that she was going to get back to her house, which was right next to my mom and dad's house. So she went to one of these checkpoints to get through, and when she came up on the first checkpoint, she encountered a highway patrolman. And that highway patrolman soon found out that Shirley Jordan was no one to mess with. She took him up one side of the road and down the other, took the National Guard to settle the dispute. So anyway, Shirley Jordan finally got to her house, and I told Linda today that she needed to be here to hear the story. I've got one more. Years ago in the old stores, you used to see the towels 
uh, pinned to the ceiling in the old stores. Well, my dad and Uncle Charles rescued 40 people, and a couple of those people were Bill and Inez Anderson. And Bill and Inez Anderson owned a, a small mom-and-pop grocery store, convenience store type thing, but they had these towels pinned all over the ceiling. There was actually 40 of them. And back then, uh, if you wanted to kind of uh, get something over on the IRS, you take a $20 bill and stick it up there in that towel, and you take a $50 bill and you stick it in that towel, and a $100 bill. And soon after that, you'd have a lot of money sticking in, the, in these towels. Well, my dad and Uncle Charles rescued uh, Bill and Inez Anderson with an airboat. They brought him to the Collington intersection, and lo and behold, Bill turned around to my dad and said, Carl, you got to go back to my store. You got to save my life savings. You got to realize the whole front of his store had been washed out. It was cinder block, but the whole front of his store had been washed out. Inside of his store was over five foot of water. So he told my dad and he told my Uncle Charles where the ladder was. You didn't have duct tape back in those days. You had jute twine. So they went back, they got 40 beach towels and they were, my dad described them as big as uh, medicine balls. That was his life savings. And when they brought it back to Collington intersection, my Lord, you'd never seen a man so happy as, as Bill Anderson and I is. But anyway, that's, that's my story and I'm sticking to it. That's a good story. Very good. Thank you. Yes, Eric. I just wanted to reemphasize a, a point because in the beginning we kind of talked about um, how we could recreate what happened and looking at that and how it was difficult. Um, one thing I kind of mentioned at the end of the video, and they did a really good job capturing it, we've improved immensely with technology, specifically with communication. A few things stood out to me in the video, mentioning teletype, that, that stood out. Um, it also stood out, uh, nothing to worry about with the storm, the weather service saying that and really not knowing it was going to be bad until it was here. Another thing that stood out was getting to Manio and didn't, they didn't know anything that was happening at the beach. That wouldn't happen today with our technology. We would know about it. But please use that technology right. Make sure you follow official sources. That technology is working. We've got Lee right now where we're standing today is 500 miles offshore and you saw the flags flying up and down the beaches not to swim. So it works. That storm, it's sunny today and we've been heavily advertising that the ocean's going to be rough. So it works. But it only works if you follow official sources. There's a tremendous amount of misinformation leading up to the storm this week. Um, putting our area at risk when it wasn't going to be at risk from a direct storm. So follow the National Hurricane Center. As we saw from this documentary, we're equal opportunity throughout the year. Year round, we can be impacted from storms, not just during tropical season. In the county, uh, raise your hand if you've signed up for OBX alerts or if you're aware of what that is. So very, very good. good. It looks like the majority of you. Mr. Drew and Mr. James can raise their hand at the back. If you do not know what that is, see them. You will get this information sent to you. You're not going to be caught off guard. You're going to know that this uh, a storm like this magnitude uh, would impact you. Another show of hands, getting back to complacency. I know this was a nor'easter, but how many of you have heard of or been to a hurricane community forum? We usually do them in Manio at the EOC. So a few people. So we are in the community as much as possible educating people about storms like this, not just hurricanes, but nor'easters. So today, do you have a plan? If we were predicting this a week from now, what is your plan? You should have a plan on what you would do. Does it include leaving the area? Where would you go? Does that include your whole home, your pets, uh, elderly parents that might live with you? Um, do you have supplies to survive for seven days? So we live in a community that is vulnerable, and you should be thinking about these things now. Um, again, the information is out there, but it's it's up to you to, to rely on it and to use it. Uh, but those are some things. I encourage you to attend one of these community forums. It's a discussion. Uh, we share stories, and we try to tell you about what the area can be impacted, not just hurricane-wise, but also coastal storms. Very good.
Thank you. So the next thing I'd like to do is ask um, any of you if you have any questions for our panelists here, and we will get a mic to you. Are we bringing it from the back, or you want to give this one? Thanks, y'all. This was great, and the film's great, and the panelists are great. Um, I wanted to say that a lot of those shots were made by the great Acock Brown, and he just, you know, a hell of a good guy, and what he went through with that storm. And um, Juanita and Buster, I wanted to ask about y'all's memories of Acock working that storm, and Acock being Acock, his generous self, I bet he was working two roles. He was probably shooting pictures and helping out when he could. Well, Acock did take some photos, but I want to give Walter Gresham uh, some credit, too. Uh, I have a autographed or a signed book by Walter Gresham, and Walter uh, helped publish this book right here, but Acock Brown did take a lot of folks, John, and uh, he he was everywhere. Uh, he would be at the docks in Oregon Inlet. He would be at the docks at uh, uh, the Manio Bridge. He'd be taking pictures, publicizing everything that happens here in Deer County. And Acar Brown was uh, the beginning of our what is known today as our tourist bureau. So, uh, yes. <laughs> yeah. He was he was something else. And one of the things in the in the video that I want to point out is uh, there was a guy in uh, Elizabeth City who owns Jeanette's Fruit and Produce produce and uh he actually rented an airplane and videotaped that little portion that you saw the carolinian hotel and some other things like that and for years i had that video and i don't have a clue where it's at today <laughs> there was a picture of my dad holding one of my nieces she was about four years old and she had a little teddy bear that she was holding and that picture went somewhere nationwide because daddy had people calling him from Texas and saying, we'll give you a job, bring that child. I think they thought that was all that was left was, <laughs> was my child. They probably didn't know the whole clan was coming. Oh my goodness. Any, any, other, any other questions for panelists? So we've talked about this storm at Nags Head. Does anybody recall what happened in Rodanthe and Duck and Kerala, those areas? I know they weren't very populated, but did the storm, was it concentrated in the accent? No, it was not. In fact, I was talking to some folks today at the Dunes restaurant that lived in uh, Massachusetts, Boston area, and they were uh, talking about maybe coming to this today because they were affected by the Ash Wednesday storm also. It tore up everything from New Jersey, and Eric, you back me up on this, everything from North Carolina, all the way to New Jersey, Boston, Mass. It went up the East Coast like uh, Montezuma's Revenge. Yeah, the the focus obviously was Nags Head, so it's a, a lot that I had looked at. But I'm a snow lover. Don't hold it against me. But they had feet of snow, Blue Ridge Mountains, snow down in Georgia, and then many impacts up and down the East Coast. So Ocean City, Maryland, parts of coastal New Jersey, uh, 70 plus mile per hour wind gusts up through Rhode Island, New, New York City area. So it was not just a North Carolina impact, um, really a true nor'easter. And as we mentioned in the video, it was the fact that it was almost stationary day after day for multiple days that caused such a big impact instead of just moving on and um, returning to nice weather the, the following day. One of the questions that I was asked in this interview, and I it did not make the screen, so it's laying on the floor somewhere, but um, was, were you worried about the people who was to the north or the south of you? Now, this is from a 12-year-old's point of view, you understand. And it took me back. I had to really think about it for a minute before I answered him, and I said, no. We were just worried about getting out of there and making sure that that ocean didn't just swallow us. You see, so... I don't know exactly what happened. As a matter of fact, it was several years before I read the Ash Wednesday storm. I mean, I'm like, you know, grown woman, maybe 10 years ago. And I looked at it and I said, oh my God, that was horrible, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah. One of the things that Juanita said in the video, one of the things that I said was, is what was our social media of the time? What was our social media? 
you know. No, school. We were so worried about not going to school because that was our social get-together. That was our social life. You didn't miss school even if you were sick. You went to school. That's the bottom line. Mary, I got one more story I want to tell real quick. Um, Diamond Shoals Light Ship. Everybody should know about Diamond Shoals Light Ship. Well, the captain of that uh, ship, actually, his name was Midget. Imagine that. Uh, the light ship was 122 feet long. It was 28 foot wide. It drew uh, 13 foot of water. It was 590 tons, which is 1,239,000 pounds of ship. All right, so that ship is anchored off Cape Hatteras, and Eric, you were talking about this a few minutes ago, about how broad the storm was. Well, Captain Midget came into my dad's hardware store, and he started telling this story about him and eight seamen. And he said that he was the chief or the captain of the, of the ship, and when the anchor started dragging on the Diamond Shoals light ship, he decided it was time for them to steam to Chesapeake Bay. Well, they got off of southern shores and this big, huge, he said over 30 foot, 30 foot wave went over to bow the boat and it moved the con tower, which is a metal uh, part of the ship where they have all the controls and everything. It moved it one foot back and every wave after that put water in the engine room and in the, the lower bilge of the ship. So he made a command decision. He turned the ship around and he went with the waves. Well, guess what? Fort Lauderdale was where they ran out of the storm. He said that was the first time that they had not rocked and rolled. So if you're a good storyteller and you could tell us a good short story that you experienced. If you were here and had an experience, we would, we would like to hear that. Is anybody who's here who has one of those stories that would like to share? Yes, ma'am. Give us your name, if you would. Marguerite Altlet from Manteo, and I want to speak on behalf of the Manteo Lions Club. Shortly after the storm over here at Nags Head, there were old buildings on the waterfront that were vacant at that time that had been stores in the past. And the Lions Club contacted different people from different areas. And there were 18 wheelers coming in to bring supplies to help to alleviate the problems that were people that had lost everything. There was furniture, there was clothing, there was baby things, there, were, there was baby formula, anything that you could think of that was needed. So many truckloads came in to the Manteo area to that people came from everywhere and got anything that they wanted. And the Lions Club took care of that at that time. And the last trailer that was re ready to come in, my husband was president of the Lions Club at that time, and he said, we can't handle anything else. Send them to Elizabeth City. Send them somewhere. Said, but we can't handle anymore. But we found that the people throughout the country, even the last truck was coming from Texas. So, so there was a lot of advertising done throughout the country, and supplies came by the truckloads, 18-wheelers just one after the other. Wonderful. Thank you. If, if you would hold that mic for just a second, I want to, oh, you can go, you, know, you can get that mic. So I want to ask that because Ms. Westcott, you mentioned a relative seeing a picture in Texas. Eric, do you, had in looking at this, what was the, what was the press like? What was the, what was the reporting on that story? How was that, what, how was that story told nationally about what had happened to the East Coast? Um, I'm not as familiar with the widespread, but it, it was um, we rate storms in the weather service in terms of like hurricanes one through five. And it was toward the, the four. There's a, a scale also for nor'easters. Uh, so it was rated toward the higher end of that press was it was national news. It was a big cool. uh, coverage, but I'm not as familiar with beyond our area. But but like I said before, it, it had covered so much of the coast. It wasn't just a, a North Carolina story. It was certainly beyond. Well, certainly Ms. Umflett makes the point. People were seeing the story and they were, they were offering to help. Anyone else? I was a junior at Manio High School 
Um, and early that morning, I got a call from a classmate who said, we have a little bit of high water coming over in Nags Head, and there's no school today. <laughs> this was at 7 o'clock. And, of course, as time went on, we find out what was going on. And I made it my business that day to drive over to as far as I could come to see what was going on. And I got to the old bridge, which is now the, you know, our high ride, the Bombay Bridge coming over from Manny at Red Oak Island to Nags Head. And it was much lower at that time, the old bridge. And I'm driving across the bridge and looking out over towards Nags Head as I come, come along. And I saw waves breaking over the dunes and the everything else um, from the bridge. I could not believe it. And another little tidbit, um, my parents built um, Evan's store which was right beside Jeanette's Pier, which is now Cahoon's. And in 1962, a couple from Swan Quarter came over to, to the Dare County, to Nags Head, and decided they wanted to look at the store, which was for sale, our Evans, uh, Evans store and cottages that my mom and dad built. And... Renee's mom and daddy had signed a contract to purchase it. And here comes the Ash Wednesday storm, and everybody thought we were all washed away. Well, as, as I recall from my parents telling me that Bray and Dorothy Cahoon came over that day, Renee, I don't know if you remember that or not, but they told me that they came over here that day to look at the at the store and to see what occurred. Uh, we were very, very fortunate. We didn't have a drop of water. It went all around us over here and up at the Sea Hotel. And, of course, the deal was sealed. <laughs> and they saw it and enjoyed it, and we were all very grateful. But it was a time, I'll tell you that. We remember it, Juanita, don't we? And, um, I remember your daddy very well, too, Buster. And it was a time um, for all of us. Renee, I'd like to hear your recollection of the other side of that story, too. I was a little young at that time. <laughs> Charles was in high school. I was still in elementary school. Okay. Yeah. But yeah, it was scary times. Yeah, it was. And it can happen again. I just wanted to add something to what Marguerite said. We didn't have a home to go back to for about three, three months. And so, of course, we had no furniture. We didn't have anything. But uh, we did get a set of bunk beds. And I'm just going to tell you a little bit about, do you ever get over a storm like this? No, you don't. Yeah. When I go to a movie like The Perfect Storm, I've had to leave the room and go out because when the waves get so big, it just, it's like it's coming back to you. But uh, I have two little grand girls and they come and stay a lot and come in the summer. And sometimes I've gone through their bedroom and they did not make their bed and they had clothes on the floor. And I've looked at them and I said, let me tell you a little story. And so they sit down and, you know, they're real sweet and they're listening. And I say, there was a story about a little girl. She was 12 years old and she didn't have any clothing and she didn't have any food and she didn't have a home to go to. And one day, wonderful, got a little house, had a set of bunk beds for she and her sister. And every day she'd get up and make her bed and make her sister's bed because she wouldn't do it. But I wanted it to look <laughs> nice. And uh, then I said, um, you know, wouldn't it just be terrible if you didn't? And they looked at me and they said, I said, that that little girl is now 75 years old and she still makes her bed every day. And they looked at me and they said, okay, Nana, we get it. <laughs> That's wonderful. All right, I got one, one thing I want to say. 
Uh, Tom McKimmy was in the in the feature today, and his grandson is with us today. So Eric, can you stand up? Yeah. Cool. You used to own Sam and Omi's right across the street years ago. Wow. Very good. Thank you again. I want to say thanks to all the people who worked to put this together. I want to say thank you to, can I have, get a round for our panelists who contributed to this, please? Um, I want to say thank you to, to, to all the staff at Current TV, the town of Nags Head, the Outer Banks History Center, all the folks who worked so hard to put this together. Uh, what a wonderful experience. I want to say thank you to all of you for coming out and making this a really special afternoon. We really appreciate y'all being here. Uh, drive safe. Have a great afternoon. Thank you.